Happy Thursday and welcome to a brand new edition of Problematic Women. I'm Lauren Evans. And I'm Virginia Allen. Virginia, have you been keeping up with the impeachment hearings this week? Well, so I haven't actually been watching them. I just haven't been able to bring myself to turn that on and <laughs> sit and watch as they go on for hours and hours and hours. Uh, but I have been listening to a lot of podcasts, like the Daily Signal podcast, which offers some great insights and kind of just the key nuggets of what's actually happening. Have Have you been watching it, Lauren? So I've probably watched at least 10 hours at my desk Ooh. of these live streams and... To be honest, I like kind of know what's going on, but at the same time, I'm just like, what are they talking about? Well, Lauren, you are in luck because I sat down with Elizabeth Slattery today and she is a legal fellow here at the Heritage Foundation. And I asked her some questions about impeachment, asked her to break it down in terms that I could understand. She did a great job. So we'll be able to fill you in on what you actually need to know. I'm legit so excited for that. And we also have so many other great topics to break down before we even get to that. That's right. We'll be recapping the March for Life, discussing yet another Teen Vogue abortion story. Of course. Yeah. (laughs) And diving into a bit of pop culture. All right. We have so much to cover. So let's go. So our first topic is Trump and March for Life. Last Friday, tens of thousands, I've even read 100,000 people gathered in our nation's capital to celebrate life at the 47th annual March for Life. This year's march had a very special guest actually in attendance, our president, President Donald Trump. Virginia, did you know he is the first sitting president to ever attend the march? That's amazing, That's Lauren. Fair. That's so cool. And he made a speech and he really stressed his administration's commitment to being pro-life. They are coming after me because I am fighting for you, and we are fighting for those who have no voice, and we will win because we know how to win. We all know how to win. We all know how to win. You've been winning for a long time. You've been winning for a long time. Together, we are the voice for the voiceless. So I just love that. We will win because we know how to win. (laughs) It's very Trump. (laughs) So Trump. So in his speech, he also highlighted a couple other ways that his administration has prevented taxpayer money for paying for abortions. He said, quote, I reinstated and expanded the Mexico City policy, and we issued a landmark pro-life rule to govern the use of Title X taxpayer funding. He also said, quote, I notified Congress that I would veto any legislation that weakens pro-life policies or encourages the destruction of human life. At the United Nations, I made clear that global bureaucrats have no business attacking the sovereignty of nations that protect innocent human life. So, Virginia, what do you take away from Trump's attendance? Actions speak louder than words. And the fact that President Trump was there in person says so much about what he stands for and what he believes. You know, it's it's really easy to talk the talk. And we've seen so many presidents who, you know, are pro-life and they'll be very open about being pro-life. But when it comes to actually taking steps towards securing the right to life for the unborn, We don't really see a lot. And so it's really encouraging to see President Trump stepping out, uh, saying, I I will stand with pro-life organizations. I will push policy forward that promotes life, that protects life. I'm really encouraged personally as a pro-lifer. I think a lot could happen this year in the pro-life movement. We have a meeting every morning at 1030. And at this meeting was when I found out that the president was speaking. And I think a couple other of my colleagues did. And I think the best reaction uh, was from Gloria Taylor on our media team. She said, great. Now the media finally has to cover the March for Life. (laughs) It's true. No, now they, they couldn't not cover it. The president was speaking there. And My goodness, I was able to attend and it was amazing. The energy in the crowd, there was people everywhere. I I got down to the mall shortly after the president had just started speaking. And I thought, well, you know, maybe somehow I would still be able to get in. Not even a chance. (laughs) Um, So I, I watched his speech on Twitter. And then, you know, as soon as all of the security came down, I fought the crowds and was able to make my way into the stadium. But it was amazing how many people were there. And I think just also how excited everyone was. Like it was just such an atmosphere of positivity. You could tell that hope was just 
really in the air. And everyone was just excited for one that the president was there. But it felt like this rally cry of, all right, America, we're all starting to get on the same page. And we're seeing a a shift in our nation that is actually valuing life. So Trump actually addressed that in his speech. He said, quote, Democrats have embraced the most radical and extreme positions taken and seen in this country for years and decades. And you could even say for centuries, nearly every top Democrat in Congress now supports taxpayer funded abortion all the way up to the moment of birth. Virginia, do you think this is true? And do you think the policies that President Trump just highlighted is something that most Americans would even support? You know, I I think what's happening right now in our nation is that you're being forced to take a side. You can no longer be neutral on the pro-life issue. So we're seeing those on the very extreme progressive left having to say, okay, if we're okay with abortion, we have to be okay with abortion right up until the point of birth. And so many Americans are realizing I can't be okay with abortion because the science does not back it. The science is fully behind the pro-life movement. And, you know, if if abortion isn't okay at 22 weeks, is it really okay at 15 weeks? Is it really okay at 10 weeks? And you just, you know, you kind of increasingly realize, oh, I I don't have a a real leg to stand on here. So I would say we're we're kind of hitting this point as a nation where I think the pro-life movement is growing much, much larger because it's just It's becoming a lot harder to be pro-choice because the science is pro-life. That wasn't all from the Trump administration that day. Health and Human Services Secretary Alex Azar spoke at the Family Research Council to announce that California is in violation of something called the Weldon Amendment which is something that's passed as part of the HHS appropriations. You see, starting in 2014, the state of California's Department of Managed Health Care declared that abortion must be included in all health care plans offered in the state. You know, this is going back to what they always say, abortion is health care. Obviously, this is a big problem for churches, convents, anyone who who really has a moral obligation. So I want to go back to what the Weldon Amendment actually is. In it, it says, none of the funds made available in this act, making appropriations for the Departments of Labor, Health and Human Services, and Education may be made available to a federal agency or program or to a state or local government if such agency, program, or government subjects any institutional or individual health care entity to discriminations on the basis that the health care entity does not provide, pay for, provide coverage of, or refer for abortion. So basically, this says if a church or another group has issues with abortions, the state can't force them to pay for it. Well, and Lauren, I think, you know, whether you are pro-choice or pro-life, you should be able to get behind this because essentially it's a First Amendment issue. It's it's freedom of religion. And we shouldn't be forcing uh, an institution to cover a service like abortion if that violates their religious beliefs. So if you're really pro-choice, you should believe that people should have choice in their health care. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> So Secretary Azar announced that California has 30 days to get in compliance with the Weldon Amendment or they're at risk of losing their HHS funding. So powerful. And I think it goes back to just the fact of when when we have a president who is pro-life, who's pushing forward on the pro-life issue, it allows the rest of his administration to be able to do the same. Yes, I love that, Virginia. Well, you might be sensing a theme this week. <laughs> we, Well, and from last week, we are just loving talking about the life issue. And right now there are just so many good stories to cover. So we have one more that we want to tackle uh, this week that is really encouraging and really positive. Dr. Kathy Altman once performed abortions for a living. She was pro-choice and performed abortions without problem, even while pregnant. But Dr. Altman is now pro-life and explained her journey in a recent op-ed in USA Today. She also told her her story on the Daily Signal podcast last September. She outlined her thinking and shared the stories of three patients who helped her become pro-life. She used to think that abortion was okay because the baby was unwanted, but soon realized that this wasn't a strong enough case, and no case was strong enough to kill your child. Dr. Altman became pro-life and is now an associate scholar with the Charlotte Lozer Institute, a group that researches and promotes the pro-life movement to policymakers and the public. In a powerful line from her op-ed, Altman says, Coming to terms with the fact that I was a professional mass murderer was devastating, but it compelled me to speak the truth. 
Wow. Her, her story really is amazing. You know, I think one of the most powerful things that really stood out to me that she said was actually in her interview with Kate Trinko back in September. And she explained that her father fought in World War II and was actually part of liberating one of the Nazi concentration camps. And she said that she read an article that compared abortion to the Holocaust and she realized wow, the whole justification that the Nazis had for killing Jews, for killing people with disabilities, was that they weren't human. And she was like, whoa, my justification for killing unborn babies is that they're not human. And that that just rocked her world from that point on. She was pro-life. Wow. It reminds me of Abby Johnson's story in Unplanned, where she saw the ultrasound guided abortion and I just actually happened to be listening to that book with my sister, the audiobook version. This weekend, I was in Florida. We were driving from Orlando to Tampa, and she had never heard it. And, and she's very pro-life. She's a very Christian listener of this podcast. Hi, Kelsey. <laughs> um, but she you could tell the pain on her face. I, I felt bad she was driving, and she was about to cry. I can't imagine having this realization. And, and you really have to give up you know, your livelihood. But things ended up turning out pretty all right for her. Well, and the power of people's stories like Dr. Altman and, and Abby Johnson is for most of us as Americans, you know, we don't really know what goes on, uh, you know, at a Planned Parenthood or, or any abortion clinic. And even if you go in and get an abortion, you're laying on the table and you're not getting that perspective that the doctor has. So to actually hear it from the perspective of medical professionals, of this is what happens, this is what goes on, this is the stories that you, that you never hear, it's really powerful and it's really sobering. Okay, while we're on the subject, it seems we can't escape Teen Vogue. I've been talking about Teen Vogue publishing basically abortion propaganda we talked about on the show last week. Pretty much anybody who will listen to me talk about it, I'm still so fired up about this. But not too long after we taped our episode last week, they came out with another article titled Five People on How They Learned Their Parents Had Experience with Abortion Too." This article once again glorifies abortion, but with a strange twist, women sharing stories of them telling their parents they had an abortion only for the parent to respond that they also had one. The article explains it as though it's something to bond with your parents over and that it's a normal part of the family. Virginia, what do you think about this? Does it make your blood boil as much as mine? <laughs> <laughs> so I think my reaction is different, Lauren. <laughs> it shows a difference in our personalities, but I just got really sad. <laughs> um, no, I mean, as I was reading it, I think you see in these women this desperate connection to heal from something that is truly traumatic taking the life of your child, there's incredible trauma there. There's incredible sorrow there. And of course, you would want to share that with someone who you loved, who you respected. And misery loves company. Uh, and it's it's kind of true that and it's like, oh, man, like you also went through this horrible thing. I also went through this horrible thing. So there there's a level of connection there. So it, to me, it's like, you know, Teen Vogue is saying, isn't this great? You know, they were realizing it's so normal. It's like, I, I think they're missing what is actually really going on here, which is two people that are hurting are able to connect and bond over their hurt. Uh, but just because they're able to connect and bond, that doesn't make it not tragic. It's like the mom has been lying to themselves their whole life. And instead of breaking that cycle, they're just trying to push that on to their child. I want to read a quote from the article that says, abortion is how we plan our families. It allows us to shape our lives. And for 59 percent of people who have had abortions, it helps us care for the children we already have. Abortion is a common experience that family members share. A fact that I realized when I told my mom that I was pregnant and wanted to have an abortion only for her to tell me about the abortion she had before giving birth to me. Man, uh, abortion is a part of how we plan our families. It should not be. <laughs> Abortion is a part of how we end our families. Yeah, exactly. Um, my goodness. And, you know, I think back to um, to Altman's stories. She talked about how she was so grieved as you know she was even still pro-choice, but she was seeing women who were using abortion as birth control. And <laughs> we have birth control pills. There are ways out there to not get pregnant. And I think to kind of take this approach to abortion of like, oh, it's just, you know, this natural thing. And it's this lovely way that you can structure your, your family and kind of make it all 
exactly how you want it to be. Just kind of sick at the end of the day. It's also misleading. They use this 59 percent of people who have had abortions. They're referring to 59 percent of people who have abortions already have another child. But they're trying to make it sound like almost 60 percent of the population has had an abortion, which that's not true. It's around 25 percent. So, again, it's just another completely misleading story from Teen Vogue. So just watch what your kids are reading This could be where your friends are getting information. So be ready to just fight these lies that we continually see out there. All right. We are going to switch gears and talk about something quite a bit lighter. We want to talk about a pop culture story that everyone just can't seem to get enough of. And our fabulous coworker who wrote an op-ed on the subject, Mexit. Yes, Meghan Markle and Prince Harry have announced their plans to step down as senior royals. From the tabloids to hardcore news, everyone is talking about Meghan's decision. And it did obtain that name, Mexit, which I love. It's so (laughs) creative. (laughs) Now, last week, our very own Kate Trinko, editor-in-chief of The Daily Signal, wrote an article titled, Meghan Markle, the American Princess, Wants Out. Maybe we should all move on. And Kate explains the American obsession with princesses and our even bigger fascination with this real-life princess, Meghan. But, you know, we really aren't in any place to judge her decision to step back And maybe, just maybe, it's time for us as women to realize that, you know, that whole princess fairy tale, maybe we should start moving on from that. I don't know, Lauren. What are your thoughts? I have brought up on the show many times, I love the Kardashians. I've kept up (laughs) with them. And I feel like it's the same thing. They make their living and their livelihood through being on screen, right? That they are only royal and rich and famous because they're royal and rich and famous, So part of me is like, you know, you married into this, but part of me is like, yeah, who cares? They're royals. They're royalty. I mean, I guess there is some significance with the queen because she I know she does have some actual power in England, but these they have no actual power. And if they want to get out of the limelight, let them get out of the limelight. But what really bothers me is when they want to kind of straddle both. They want to have complete privacy and be left alone. But then when they want to have like a blockbuster movie, they're like, oh, you remember me? And then they go on world tour again. (laughs) Pay attention to me. (laughs) Yeah. No, I mean, uh, I I am a fan of The Crown, the series that Mm -hmm. kind of goes through that whole uh, life of the royal family and Queen Elizabeth. And it it's very fascinating. Uh, you realize that these are just people. They're people with massive issues. There's a ton of family drama. And it just sort of like, OK, it's just continuing. The saga continues. But yeah, I mean, of course, you can see as as an American, we all kind of look at the royal family and it's like, Oh, that's so cute and it's so romantic. But I'm sure for for Megan, not at all kind of growing up with that in in her background of, um, you know, really understanding what that is to the British people, uh, what that represents, what the crown represents to then step into that. You know, there's no amount of preparation you can do to fully kind of wrap your brain around what you're walking into. So I'm not surprised that she wants out. It's fine. You know, they can do with their life what they want. As a family, I I do kind of feel for Kate and William because I'm like, well, gosh, that just adds even more pressure to their life. So you sort of see history repeating itself with the royals. (laughs) Very similar situation uh, has happened in the past. But Lauren, why do you think as Americans we are so obsessed with the royal family? Because it would be great. Imagine I'm walking out of Heritage tomorrow. I trip. All of a sudden, a cute 30-something-year-old gentleman offers his hand. We have this total meet cute. He flies me to some random European country. I get to, I mean, I love my job here, but I get to quit my job, live in a fancy house. I mean, that... So you're describing every Hallmark movie. Every Hallmark movie. But I, I think that's what we envision. It's one of those like little hopes that we all have in our, our lives that it's like, oh, this if, if this can happen to Meghan Markle, it can happen to me. Yeah, no, I mean, it is it's kind of fun to just think about and dream about. Not necessarily very practical. Not at all. Not at all. (laughs) I must say, though, I was a huge fan of Princess Diaries as a kid. Such a great movie. You are Princess (laughs) of Genovia. (laughs) All right. So what do you think is next, though, for Megan? I mean, what is she going to do with all the time that she now has on her hands? I would love for her to spend time with her husband and with her new child and, and just really enjoy motherhood. I don't think that she'll stay away from 
the limelight. Like I mentioned, I, I really think you'll start hearing her doing voiceovers and movies um, and really leaning into her acting career. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's going to be impossible for them to stay out of the eye of the public. The paparazzi is always going to be following them. They're loved uh, across America, across Europe. So they're not going away anytime soon. All right. While we're on the subject of pop culture, Taylor Swift has a movie coming out on Netflix tomorrow called Miss Americana. And it really seems from the trailer to imply that it's largely about Taylor's decision to get political and stop being a nice girl. Now, I plan to watch it this weekend and uh, we'll have some hot takes to share with you next week. But if you watch it over the weekend and have thoughts, be sure to tweet using the hashtag problematic women and we might read your tweet on the air. Yes, you should do it. You know, it's really unfortunate the Problematic Woman only comes out one day a week. I I know you guys are just clamoring for more content because it is so easy to get overwhelmed by this 24-7 news cycle. And I have something for you. The Daily Signal podcast comes out every weekday morning, so you'll have to double up on Thursdays. But it is just such a great way to get information that really matters. From people that you can trust, there are colleagues here at The Daily Signal. Virginia co-hosts the Monday edition with our colleague Rob Bluey. Kate Trinko and Daniel Davis do Tuesday through Friday. It's just really great. It's something that I personally listen to, so I would make sure to go out and listen to it. It's The Daily Signal podcast. And you can get it anywhere you get your podcast: Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Overcast, just anywhere. We are joined today by Elizabeth Slattery, a legal fellow from the Mies Center for Legal and Judicial Studies here at the Heritage Foundation. As we've all seen, the impeachment trial is taking over the news and, well, it can be quite confusing. That's why we have our good friend Elizabeth here to make some sense out of all of it. Elizabeth, thank you so much for being here. Thanks for having me. So can you just start by giving us a quick summary of what's happened so far? Why is President Trump facing impeachment charges? So last fall, the the House of Representatives opened an impeachment inquiry, and they ultimately, after uh, hearing from a number of witnesses, uh, they, they voted on two articles of impeachment, which they have now sent over to the Senate. The first article was abuse of power, and uh, the the charge is that President Trump tied military aid, conditioned military aid on um, – Ukraine publicly announcing that it was going to investigate a couple of things. It would investigate former Vice President uh, Joe Biden's son and his involvement with a Ukrainian company. And second, investigating the allegations that Ukraine was involved with an interference with the 2016 election, uh, which many people say, you know, it was Russian interference with the 2016 election. So that was the first article. The second article is that President Trump has obstructed Congress. And this stems from the actual impeachment inquiry because the president uh, – the, the White House and the administration uh, refused to send over certain documents and would not make certain individuals available for uh, for testimony. And the the House issued subpoenas, and typically they would then go to court to have those subpoenas enforced. And uh, that initially happened with, uh, with a couple instances. And uh, one instance in particular, the House, instead of waiting uh, to see how the court would rule, the House just withdrew the subpoena and then uh, decided to, to vote on that as an, a separate article of impeachment. So those are the two articles that have been sent over to the Senate, which now the, the trial is underway. So these two articles, abuse of power and obstruction of Congress, the Senate has them. What does the Senate do with them? What's going on right now in the Senate? Sure. So the the trial is in its second week. And it began with opening arguments with the House managers. These are uh, representatives from the House of Representatives who have been selected by um, Speaker of the House Nancy Pelosi to basically be the prosecutors. And then uh, so they've put on their case. They had a certain number of hours over uh, over several days to make their arguments for both of the articles of impeachment that have been uh, sent over to the Senate. And President Trump's defense team uh, have also had several days to make uh, to make their case as well. So that is coming to a conclusion. After that, the senators will have the opportunity to submit questions in writing uh, 
Chief Justice John Roberts, as the presiding officer, will read those questions and they will be put to either the House managers or the defense team to answer. And then at the end of the week, uh, we expect that the Senate will will first take a vote on whether or not they're going to allow any additional witnesses. And this is what everyone expects to be the big showdown is whether they're going to add any witnesses. So first they'll, they'll vote on whether they're going to consider any additional witnesses at all. And if that vote is successful, then they would consider individual people uh, and whether they're going to subpoena specific individuals. And do they have to vote for each individual or is it just once they decide, OK, we can hear more witnesses, it's anyone is fair game? It's my understanding that they would have an individual vote on each person. They would then subpoena. And once someone is subpoenaed, then if they comply, which that could potentially end up uh, having a court challenge, uh, trying to enforce the subpoena, if they comply, then the Senate, the two teams, the defense and the House managers would first conduct depositions of the people. So they uh, they may not even appear before the Senate in, in live testimony. So this sounds like it could take a while. Yes, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> How long could this be drawn out for potentially? Well, if we look at just as a parallel to President Clinton's impeachment, uh, the the trial took about five weeks. If we go back further in history to President Andrew Johnson's impeachment, that was, I think, 11 weeks. They had, you know, dozens of witnesses then. Um, three witnesses in President Clinton's impeachment, and all of them were deposed, and then selections of their deposition were played instead of um, having live testimony before the Senate. Interesting. So who are the key players that we should be aware of right now? Well, they're all of the House managers. Okay. I mean, obviously, Representative Adam Schiff is getting a lot of media attention. He's sort of, you know, he's kind of the lead of the prosecution team. There are all of the members of President Trump's defense team, some well-known names in legal circles, including uh, former independent counsel Ken Starr and a longtime pretty well-known uh, criminal defense lawyer Alan Dershowitz, uh, Jay Sekulow, who heads up the uh, American Center for Law and Justice, Pam Bondi, who's the attorney general of Florida. And of course, now the focus will kind of be, be pivoting to the senators and considering which of the Republicans may be willing to come over and join the Democrats to allow for witnesses. Uh, so we'll kind of be keeping an eye on that this week. And one of the names that all of a sudden we're hearing a lot about in the news is John Bolton, President Trump's former national security advisor. Why is his name coming up? What is his role in all of this? So John Bolton, as you said, was uh, a member of the, the Trump administration uh, until last summer. He has um, a book that's coming out and a couple of chapters were leaked over the weekend. And so now there is discussion about uh, whether or not he should come before the Senate to testify. He did not testify before the House uh, during its impeachment inquiry uh, last fall, though. Interesting. So many different pieces and moving things going on. All right. So I want to switch gears a little bit and talk about Saturday Night Live. <laughs> you saw the SNL impeachment sketch from this past Saturday that likened uh, Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell to Jeffrey Epstein. And wow, it was frankly just a really kind of sick joke or it made a kind of a really sick joke out of the entire impeachment process. And, you know, we all know not to take SNL too seriously, that they lean really far to the left. But do you think that this sketch went too far? And what are the facts that SNL really chose blatantly to ignore? Well, the first thing that struck me was that, you know, they made the there was this line about how, you know, basically saying this was like a criminal trial that, you know, it's a trial, but we're not going to have any evidence or witnesses. But there are some similarities between an impeachment trial and a run of run of the mill criminal trial, you know, that Americans are familiar with from Law and Order or you know any other sort of legal drama on TV. Uh, but it's not exactly the same as as a, a typical trial. And as I mentioned earlier, in the the Clinton impeachment, for example, they didn't have live witnesses. Uh, they had you know recorded uh, selections of recorded depositions that were uh, that were played for the senators. So trying to say that well. Well, this is a trial, but they're not going to allow any evidence or or any witnesses is um, is a little unfair because there's a you know twenty five thousand page record that came over from the House that the senators have to consider. They have the hours upon hours of presentations from the House managers and the defense team. They have the trial briefs that the House managers and defense team uh, have have submitted. So there's there's plenty of stuff for them to consider uh, if they ultimately do not add additional witnesses. 
So what, in your opinion, is the expected outcome of the impeachment hearings in the Senate? An impeachment of a president requires a two-thirds vote of the Senate. So that would require quite a few of the Republicans to cross over and vote to convict President Trump. I mean, I think it, I haven't done the math. Someone else can do that. But I think it's something like 20 Republicans uh, would, would have to cross over. And that just seems like a, a really high, uh, a high bar that I'm, I'm not sure that uh, that that can happen. So if the Senate votes in February not to remove the president, does life just kind of go back to normal? What happens then? Well, Democrats have been talking about trying to impeach President Trump since pretty early on in in the Trump administration. So, you know, there are already suggestions that additional articles of impeachment could be considered. The House is within its right to do that, to uh, to consider additional articles. But impeachment is really supposed to be an extraordinary action. And we're coming up on a presidential election in the next several months. And it seems like the American people will have their opportunity to say whether or not they want President Trump to continue in office. And so at a certain point, it seems like the impeachment process needs to end and we should just allow the American people to decide if President Trump should be reelected. And uh, even though President Trump has been impeached by the House, he's still allowed to run for re-election, correct? That's correct. Yes. he um, He's just been impeached by the House. He hasn't been convicted and removed from office. Uh, so, no, that doesn't affect the, the upcoming election at all. Elizabeth, thank you so much for your time. We really appreciate you giving us the rundown on what's going on and helping us sort through all the craziness. Happy to be here. What the heck is trickle-down economics? Does the military really need a space force? What is the meaning of American exceptionalism? I'm Michelle Cordero. I'm Tim Desher. And every week on the Heritage Explains podcast, we break down a hot button policy issue in the news at a 101 level. Through an entertaining mix of personal stories, media clips, music, and interviews, we help you actually understand the issues. So do this. Subscribe to Heritage Explains on iTunes, Google Play, or wherever you get your podcasts today. Welcome back. Okay, it's now that time of the week, our favorite time of the week, time to crown our problematic woman of the week. That's right. This week, it's a good friend of ours, Karen Lips, founder and president of the Network of Enlightened Women. Well, she recently wrote an op-ed in the Washington Examiner titled, Women's Magazine Completely Ignores Conservative Women. In this article, she discusses InStyle's BA50 2020 which highlights 50 influential women. The list includes three female politicians, but to no surprise, not one of them are Republican. That's correct. The article goes on to explain how, unfortunately, this is not the first influential women's list to leave out conservative women. Glamour and our favorite, Teen Vogue, (laughs) (laughs) both had released lists from 2019 exclusively highlighting women on the left. In a line from her op-ed, Karen says, When women's magazine claimed to represent all women but praise and prop up only one set of ideas, they send the message that only those views are valid. She goes on to say how with 2020 being the 100th anniversary of women gaining the right to vote, it is time to be more inclusive of women with different ideologies because all women don't think the same way and we have to embrace our differences in order to continue advancing women. Close mindsets is not getting us anywhere. All right, Lauren, why do you think conservative women get excluded from these articles time and time again? Because it's easier to just ignore us than to try to have conversations with us or have arguments because they know that, honestly, we have pretty great arguments and they're really hard to push back on. And so they would rather just not have a dialogue than risk losing the dialogue. Yeah, no, I think you're right. We we don't fit that narrative on the left of, you know, all women are pro-choice, all women are kind of angry at men. <laughs> like those standard things that we see from the feminist movement are not represented by conservative women. But I, I love what Karen brought up that, you know, in this time when we're celebrating women's rights to vote, we're celebrating that diversity. It does such a disservice to women to make it sound like we're all the same. We all have the same ideas. We're kind of this robotic mass that believes the same way. 
No, I totally agree. And I mean, that's what our show is named after the article called What Do We Do With Problematic Women? Talking about women who are making a difference, who are standing up for what they believe in. And if they were on the left, they would be drooling over, but they ignore them when they're on the right. So do you think that there's anything that we can do to make these lists more well-rounded? Just keep being outspoken. Keep doing what you guys are doing. Being awesome women, strong women. Be confident in your femininity. Be confident in your desire to be a mother or supporting mothers around you. Be the person that you were created to be, whoever you believe your creator might be. And yeah, just be confident in yourself and have conversations with people. Be kind, but be firm. Yeah, Lauren, I agree. I think the worst and the most dangerous thing that we can do as conservative women is just allow ourselves to be silenced. It's so important to put your views out there, to be vocal, and and to do it in such a way that is respectful and that's not angry or shouting or upset, but that presents our views well, that explains, hey, uh, you know, these are other powerful women that I look up to. And just because they don't fit this feminist narrative does not make them any less powerful. So we we really encourage you to speak your voice, speak loudly, but uh, also be following some of these other amazing conservative women who are doing incredible things. We will be sure to link Karen's article in the show notes so you can see some of those names that she mentions. So be sure to check out Karen's article and stay problematic. Congratulations, Karen. That's going to be it for this week's edition of Problematic Women. Join us next Thursday morning for a brand new edition of Problematic Women. In the meantime, please subscribe and share. Conservatives need your support in the podcast world, and we would greatly appreciate a five-star review on Spotify, SoundCloud, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. It really does make such a difference. Have a great week. Problematic Women is brought to you by more than half a million members of the Heritage Foundation. It is a product of the Daily Signal produced by Kelsey Bowler, Lauren Evans, and Virginia Allen. Special thanks to our editor-in-chief, Katrina Trinko. We produce Problematic Women in remembrance of our dear friend and former co-host, Bree Page.